Welcome to the Angel Investors Network podcast, the first national angel group founded online in 1997, dedicated to perpetuating free enterprise, capitalism, and supporting the American dream. In addition, Angel Investors Network is the organization behind the powerful Mastermind Investment Club, dedicated to harnessing the philosophy of a mastermind to increase success with their investment portfolio. Laura Rubenstein is a social media and marketing strategist and founder of the Social Buzz Club. On the podcast, Laura brings together successful entrepreneurs to share with you how they grow their business, and you can too. And now, here's your host, Laura Rubenstein. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Angel Investors Network podcast. I'm Laura Rubenstein, and I'm super excited for today's guest. We are helping businesses, startups, and angel investors take their businesses to the next level. And our guest today has done that and has a very interesting background. In fact, his name is Alexander Lowry, and he's a seasoned executive with over 15 years of experience in financial services and strategy consulting. He's a professor of finance at Gordon College, and he started and is now director of the Masters of Finance program there. He's also a CEO advisor and board of directors member for financial services and financial tech companies. In fact, currently he's working with over 20 early stage and middle market businesses. And his background includes working at J.P. Morgan Chase, where he served in senior roles, including deputy to the chief operating officer of the U.S. private bank and leading the firm's private foundation. Welcome, Alexander. Thank you, Laura. Delighted to be with you today. Well, you have a diverse background, and we're going to get all into it. But I like to start. Um, I like to start where I start with everyone, and, and finding out where you came from. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? That set the foundation. Sure. So it, it depends where you are in the country. So if you are a real New Yorker, like a Manhattan type person, you would say I grew up in New Jersey. So we lived in New York when I was very young. We moved out to Jersey because the public schools in New York were not good at the time. But when I lived in other parts of the country, when I lived in London, it was much easier just to say I was New York. But uh, real New Yorkers would call me a bridge and tunnel. I'm from Jersey. Gotcha. I'm from Jersey, too, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so what was your... That's such a bad place. <laughs> no, it's a great place to grow up. Heck yeah. So what was your childhood like? So my parents divorced when I was 13, and I have two younger sisters. So I had a household with uh, three women coaching me and guiding and directing me. And you would think my fashion would be a lot better as a result of that, but uh, that is not the case. But I've got a wonderful mother and two great sisters, and we had uh, two cats and a dog, and it's sort of the typical suburban life. Yep, I can relate. Um, so, you know, you've been working in financial services. Now you're working for a higher education uh, company or university or college, and you uh, are a board of director members. How did you get started? I mean, like, where did you start your career? <laughs> so I guess it all starts from when I graduated Haverford College for undergrads. So it's a small school outside of Philadelphia, great liberal arts education. I was trying to figure out, did I want to start on Wall Street, which I thought would be really cool, or do I start in management consulting? And with a liberal arts education, consulting, I think, is about perfect because you know a little bit about everything, not a lot about anything per se. But all of these companies, when you join them, they're going to train you up in the ways they want you to do business, how they want you to interact with clients. So I thought it was a great fit. It's a wonderful learning curve you're going up. So you're learning about the details of a business, but you've got the skills to do the researching, the writing, writing, the communicating, the presenting. So I think it fits really well with management consulting. That's why I started my first dozen years. Wonderful. So you did some management consulting, and then how did that transition into helping, you know, advising CEOs and being involved in a master's program for finance? Well, the beautiful part about being a management consultant is you come out of school, you're 22-ish years old, and you have no business sitting around boardrooms, right? You have no business sitting with CEOs, but that's what you get to do. And that's the really cool part about it. I think you grow as a result faster than that. And that really opened up my eyes to thinking that I like this environment. I like being with these people. I like sharing my thoughts. Because in many ways, as a consultant, you're there to give them alternative views, to challenge them, not to be a yes man. And I really like that perspective. So after a dozen years in consulting, when you're working in different industries, different sectors, different problems, I love that variety. But I knew I wanted to try Wall Street because I thought about it from Haverford. I really want to scratch that itch. So for me, my Warden MBA was the perfect excuse and opportunity to move across. So I went from there over to J.P. Morgan. 
worked there for about four and a half years in some great roles. So it was a very hard time when I started. JP Morgan was on the front page of all the newspapers. We had the London Whale scandal. It was a great time to be there to learn the business, to help them solve a lot of their problems, move forward. And uh, I, I'm happy to come back and do more detail on it. But the short version is after four and a half years, my now wife, we were engaged, was saying, you know, I don't know if you working 100 hours a week in a bank is really what we want for our life. <laughs> We started looking around. Both of my parents were professors, so while academia wasn't on my radar per se, it fit when this opportunity came up. And the wonderful thing here is Gordon College is a very much an undergrad-focused institution, beginning to think about how do we diversify adding some master's programs. They wanted to launch a master's in finance program, which for me was a perfect fit on my background, it brings all of my skill set, my network, and my experience up to the college where I get a much higher quality of life. I get to be home every night and see my six-month-old daughter. I'm very lucky. So what would you say are some of the most common mistakes that you've seen through your corporate and entrepreneurial journey? So I'll answer this also from an interesting time at J.P. Morgan. We talked about how the press was beating it up. The reality for J.P. Morgan, people talk about too big to fail. I prefer to think of it as you've got four or five Fortune 500 companies within one company. You've got a quarter of a million people. It is, even for the best banker in our generation, Jamie Dimon, to manage, it is ridiculously hard. And maybe there's a couple lessons I would draw out. One is issues don't age well, right? And that was one of the problems is that people might have seen things on the bottom level, but if they were not coming up to senior management quickly enough, issues just simply don't age well. And another problem was management not being in touch with what was happening at the bottom. There were lots of layers of bureaucracy. They did not have the finger on the pulse. Things escalated out of control. And when you think about someone, say, starting up a new business, if it's just you in a garage, you know what all the issues are because you're doing it yourself. Um, once you've got your first couple of partners, it's still pretty easy to stay in touch. You're having regular conversations. Once you start getting a little bit bigger, 10, 20, 50 people, it becomes a massive difference. And some people, for example, let's say they graduate college, they start up a company right away. You wouldn't know any different. You're not aware of the other problems, what can grow and develop. Maybe that's why the management consultants are so helpful again. They see different industries, different size sectors. So as someone who sees these mistakes having been made, like you don't know what the issues are, what can organizations do to either improve the communications or solve those issues? So for me, part of it is uh, depend on the size of the company. Let's talk startups. Um, when you're a giant company, you have processes and systems in place and bureaucracy is what you need to some extent. But when you're a smaller company, you're trying to be nimble. You're trying to go as fast as you can to be reactive to your customers, to get early feedback so you can grow and change and develop however you need to. One of the ways I think about it is I want to empower my staff. I view my job as not just getting things done, but also helping them throughout their careers, whether they're with my firm for six months or six years or 60 years. I want them to be their best people to grow and develop. I want to encourage them to grow and change. That requires a lot more time and energy from me. But I also think about it as my key team, right? So if I'm the CEO, I've got a COO, a CFO, a CIO, whoever those people are, I'm encouraging them to be in touch with their individual teams. And if you're still a small startup, it's not too hard. Let's say you have 50 people. You've got a couple of different groups of people. They should be in touch with their staff. They should be developing those relationships, encouraging people to be involved. I think about the kind of person is that you can either over or under communicate. I would much rather have someone tell me, you are giving me way too much information. I hear about the same stuff from you all the time. That's a really good situation. Usually people say, I don't know what's going on. I don't have my finger in the pulse. I don't feel engaged. So I think that's a, a sense of feedback of you're not going to hear about the issues. Right. Got to know the issues to solve them. Otherwise, you might wind right. up in that big mess, which, you know, is a lesson we're learning from you. So what's the best advice? <laughs> you, what's the best advice you ever received? I, I'm also big on mentorship, right? And I believe not only in giving it to other people, getting it for myself, I have my own personal board of managers. And someone, when I was getting my first, or my first or my second job, they suggested treat your boss as a potential future mentor. Now, you may not get on, you may not feel that way in the end, but when you walk in on the first day, think about establishing that relationship. Think about what this person can give you outside of just your marching orders. Think about how much you can learn from them. And I also take that a next step. And I, I, the analogy for me is dating, right? So before I met my most amazing wife now, I dated other people. And those relationships, by definition, didn't work out because I didn't get married to them. But I learned something from all of them. You think about it as accounting side debits and credits. 
things I do want and don't want in my future relationship. In the same way in a working environment, I look at my boss, is this the sort of style I want? Is this not what I want to be? Is this the culture I want? Is this not what I want? What can I take away? And especially if I'm thinking, I'm going to get some years of working experience, and then I'm going to go start my own company. What do I want to take from the different environments and the people that I've seen to bring forward for my own self? Awesome. So I guess that works whether you're the boss too. You can learn from the people you bring in too. Absolutely. When I think about hiring people, I never want to be the smartest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. If I am, we're in trouble, especially if I'm the CEO. I don't want yes people around me. I'm people who have a healthy challenge, right? You don't need to be challenged for the sake of challenge. But I don't ever want to say, here's the idea team. What do you think? And they all say, that's great. Because then I know there's a big problem because my ideas are not all great. They should have thoughtful perspectives of, well, that's really good, but what about if we thought about it in a different way? You need people around you who are truth tellers and give you advice. So I take it you have people like that around you all the time, and you're like that for others on their board. <laughs> that's exactly the way that I think about it. Um, so one quick story back in the management consulting days, I was sharing this with someone earlier. There was a decision the CEO was going to make that I fundamentally disagreed with. I thought it sort of blurred the lines of perhaps an ethical boundary that I would not have wanted to push, and that's my own personal style. And this was a dictatorial CEO. And I'm the one management consultant in the room. He's going around with his top team. What does everybody think? And they're all basically saying, yes, go and do it. He's going to do it anyway. So they're figuring, why should I make a problem? And he got to me, and I'm at the end. And I'm thinking, how do I get this guy to possibly consider an alternative? I said, all I said was, that is a really brave decision. And I sat there very quietly. And he looked at me. He looked at everybody else in the room. And he looked, came back and he said, what are you talking about? which was just a foray for me to be able to say, well, how about this as an alternative? He ended up doing what he wanted to do, but I felt like I found a way to connect with him at least to give him that alternative thought. And as a consultant, I feel like that's my view in the same way as a board. So you have hired the CEO, you've empowered the CEO to be successful. As a board, you could choose to override him, but that's not a really good relationship. At the end of the day, you've given him the marching orders to run the business, but you do want to be strategic about the advice you give him. And sometimes, you're thinking this could go either way. Here's the view I want you to take. And you think about the communication style you have so that someone can take the feedback. Mm, wonderful. So what do you think is the best advice you've ever given? That I've ever given? <laughs> I like to talk about hiring people. So my favorite business book is Good to Great. I don't know if you've have you ever read that one. Uh -huh. I love the analogy of the bus, right? You want to get the right people on the bus and you don't know what seats they're in yet till they're all on the bus, right? So you think you're hiring a CFO, but you're not really sure. You just know that this guy's really smart, really talented. I think the hiring of the people is the most important thing for any company, right? Forget about the product. Everybody has a product. Think about Southwest, right? You cannot duplicate them because of their people. They will let anyone come in and benchmark them knowing you can't take our people. You can take our process, but our people make the difference. I think about that for someone hiring a company. These are people who are going to interface with your clients, or interface with your partners. These are people who are going to work hard for you. You want the right people around you. And I only look for two things when I hire, and I try to coach everybody else. Most people when they hire, especially the a big company like a JP Morgan, you have a job spec, and you're trying to get someone to solve it. You want the person who's done it before. I sort of think that is lazy hiring, lazy management. That is not the right way to go because no one wants to do the same thing for their whole life. Maybe you're paying them a little bit more so they're there for a short term. Then you got to fill the role again. I tend to think of it as I only want two things for someone I hire. I want intelligence and I want passion because you can't teach intelligence and you can't teach passion. I can teach you anything else beyond that. That does assume I'm going to invest in you and I've got to put a lot of time and energy to get you up to speed. But once you're there, I think you're more loyal. I think you'll do a better job and I'll be glad to have you. Fabulous. That's great advice. So let's talk about you building this new part of the college. This is a, you said it's a four-year college undergrad. They didn't have a graduate program and somehow you got charged with the, <laughs> the new business model here for them. So tell us about that and what's working to grow it. So it is a one year, the full name, it doesn't roll off the tongue, Master of Science in Financial Analysis. As we dumbed it down before, it's just a master's in finance is the easiest way to think about it. And for us, you could build the greatest program in the world, and I hope that we will. But if no one knows about it, it doesn't really matter. Right? Does the tree fall in the forest if no one hears it? So a big part of that is I sort of have three jobs. And there's the job in the middle, which is building the program, putting the processes in place, getting the faculty ready, all the syllabi for the classes. There's finding the students and bringing them into the program. 
and then helping the students get great jobs when they leave the program. So those are my three jobs. The middle one will eventually sort of fade into the background over time. And a big part that sort of surrounds all of that, if you like, is the marketing, the raising awareness around it. And of course, in these tough times for educational institutions, they don't want to be spending gobs of money on it. It's a very different world from my JP Morgan. So how do you squeeze a dime out of a nickel? How do you be really smart and clever? How can you use opportunities to leverage that for raising awareness? And I, I think we've come up with a couple ideas. And would you like me to go down that track? Or Yeah, I'd love to. Okay, okay. So in parallel with launching this program, I realized it's not going to be successful unless I connect with our alumni. Now, Gordon's not a huge alumni place, maybe 12,000 Swiss alums, something like that. Clearly, I want to grab all of them and bring them close to me. And in, up here in Boston, they call it the BC Network. So Boston College Network dominates Boston. If you are not part of it, some deals don't happen. And I thought, how do we make Gordon's version of the BC Network? And then I realized there's a larger perspective of the people in finance interested in what we're doing. How do we connect with them? So I've got the master's in finance program off and running over here, but I'm also starting what we call the Finance and Faith Forum to connect with the people in Boston. Now, someone would argue if they're a pessimist, I'm Machiavellian. It's good for my program. It's also good for Gordon College, but we think it's great for everybody else we're connecting to. Builds them a network that will add a lot of value. We have quarterly events. We had our first one last week with Bob Dahl, which is a big name speaker in the industry. Everybody came away thinking this is stuff that I can take away for my own self, that I can take back to the office and I can implement. And for us, it was a great opportunity to raise awareness of the program. And we got a whole bunch of people that put their hands up and said, hey, I'll mentor, I'll intern, whatever you need me to do. We feel very lucky about that. Fabulous. And that's, so that's a brand new thing. How, how many um, graduates have you had from this master's program so far? Well, we, we're just in the middle of finishing up our first semester. So, so far it's zero. Okay, so, uh, so how I many can are say going 100% through? 100% will be employed. <laughs> so how, we're, we're in our beta. Yeah. Okay, great. And How our many first are in class the has program? Ten. Ten. We have great. ten for our first class, which is the right number to test it out on, make sure everything's set up correctly. That's great. And you enrolled the first ten through how? Uh, before I got here, they had done a little bit of testing in the neighborhood, some local outreach, and the opportunity for me has been to expand it beyond that. Right? How do we connect with the right people on a local, national basis as well? So. Maybe there are people that grew up in the area and want to come back afterwards, and this is a great way to get the first job and be more successful. Think about someone who's going to a college out in the middle of nowhere where you can't get the big companies to come in because they don't have enough staff to hire in that sort of environment. So maybe coming and being on the outskirts of Boston, which is the second or at least the third biggest finance hub in the country, is very desirable. So there's a lot of different levers we need to figure out how to connect with our audience. Well. Cool. So what types of marketing are you, are, you going, are you planning on putting in place? So we're, at the moment, I would say, and this is what I recommend for all the entrepreneurs, you sort of have to test, right? You really need to probe, figure out, you can think about SEO, what are the right words to do that? It's also, where is your audience hanging out? The problem for me is I got lots of different audiences. So I've got people direct from undergrad, I've got people two to seven years out of undergrad instead of getting an MBA, I've got people doing the part-time who are local, trying to find out ways to connect with them. One of the great channels that I've really been enjoying is the podcast because I get to test my messaging live with someone. I get good feedback on it. Um, we're getting those out there and we're getting feedback from people who are listening to it. I had someone who went to our website who's coming to the Finance and Faith Forum last week. He said, I didn't really get your program until I heard you describe it. And that story actually now clicked for me. So now I can tell other people about it. So what I've also realized, because it's a bit complex, I'm still getting my elevator pitch down exactly as short as it should be. This medium is really helpful for people. We've had people say, I've enjoyed listening to it in the car ride. I don't have to actually have a transcript. I'm also finding out that the millennials don't really like the written word. They like to hear it instead. Mm -hmm. So we're adjusting our approach and trying out different mediums. So social media has been great for us. LinkedIn and Twitter have been wonderful. We can get um, like a Bob Dahl, like a big name like that. We can put it on our Twitter profile. He's got such a big following. It raises awareness for us. So we're trying to be clever about our budgeting money. Yep. And so what are your biggest marketing challenges now? So for us, you know, we can imagine there's certain colleges that are a great fit with us who don't have this sort of program, whose faculty are aligned with our views, our values, and they will be great ambassadors for us as soon as I help, help more of them understand our program and how to take it forward. So part of it for me is getting on the road, making those individual connections. And the beauty of that will be replicating every year because they're talking to students about what their career should do year in and year out. So for me, it's finding some time to get out there and make the right connections. 
And just having opportunities like college career fairs where you're out there talking to students about their grad school and helping them understand maybe the default doesn't have to be a two-year MBA. Have you considered this sort of alternative to it? And that's a big change because everybody in America says MBA or bust. It's just the way we think. That's the way I thought. That's why I went to Wharton. <laughs> there you go. So what do you think is your differentiating part of your message? Uh, is it just that you, they could do this alternative in one year versus an MBA? Or is there something else that you do to stand out in the crowded marketplace of MBAs? So there's a couple parts for us. So there's three aspects of the program. One is the traditional MBA versus ours, two years, and the opportunity costs two years out of salary. Uh, the cost of the program average MBA tuition is 140000 Ours is thirty, so we don't burden students with more debt because they're all overloaded with that. So there is that chance to just specialize in what you want to do and get back and start your career. So if you're coming out of undergrad and you you might have studied finance or you studied business, but you were at a school where you couldn't get the big companies near you, they're too far away. Now you've got Boston on your doorstep. You can go make that connection. You're also a differentiator because you've got a master's degree. And I think about J.P. Morgan. I'm hiring an analyst. I've got a stack of resumes this big. And how do I get the small stack I actually look at? Someone has this sort of qualification. You've done some extra studies. I can tell you're really excited about and focus on this as a career choice. That's a big part of it for us. Um, it's also finding the people that want to be in Boston, that love the area, that want to come back to it and use our connections to get that first job is an easy way to do it. We think there's a couple different levers. Wonderful. What would you like to share that I haven't asked you? You know, I guess for me, it's as simple as um, how do people think about graduate school? How do millennials change the world, right? There's this, we're talking about startups in many ways. So I think there's going to be a perspective for a lot of people of, I don't want to go work for IBM for 40 years and get the gold watch. That's what my grandfather did. Or maybe what my generation, my parents' generation were doing is mostly, I'm going to go work for a big corporation and I'll probably have multiple big corporations throughout my life. I think the millennials these days and the generation behind them are saying, I will build my own career, whether it's a startup, maybe I'll, I'll have a bunch of different jobs, and that's part of the gig economy because it gives me flexibility in my lifestyle. And the way that I tend to talk to people, um, as I coach some of our undergrad students, they are so stressed about trying to figure out what they want to do with their life, to which I say, you don't need to know that yet. That is a little bit early. I think you should get your first job, get excited about it, try it out. See how it goes. That might change your mind. In the same way, people starting up businesses, I think you learn so much, a lot faster than you would otherwise. You get the T-shirts and the scars to prove it when you do a startup. It's a great grounding experience. But at what I tend to think about for a master's is you might decide to pivot. You might decide to change. This wasn't for you. It was too stressful. And I think it opens up a lot of doors. So I would tell people, maybe give yourself that tool in your arsenal. you got that bow in your quiver that you can pull out when you need to. Beautiful. Well, your story is certainly inspiring. You're helping us um, to understand the marketplace way better um, and how to grow a new division in the nom in kind of a, uh, a whole new region. So thank you for sharing your success and your endeavors and your lessons and your wisdom. And we're be back with another episode of the Angel Investors Network podcast real soon. Thanks again, Alexander. Thank you, Laura. It's a pleasure. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.